If anyone is on the line, my name is Sherry Wilson. I just wanted to let you know we're holding off for about five or six minutes before we're going to start the webinar. So welcome, and if you just don't mind... Hi, Sherry, this is Numan here. Can you... Um... Can you speak uh, right now? I just want to make sure that we can all hear you. Certainly. Good morning. My name is Sherry Wilson. If there's anyone who's joining this webinar right now, I just ask for your patience. We're going to hold on for about five or six more minutes before getting started. So welcome and you can get settled. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great. So I can see that we have 12 attendees so far. Uh, for those of you that are just joining, my name is Sherry Wilson. I'm going to be facilitating today's session along with some other key members of the team at Your Doctors Online. Just asking for your patience for a few moments while we wait until we get to that about 11.32 time frame and then we'll get started. Thank you. I can see that there's a couple of more people joining. Good morning. My name is Sherry Wilson. I'm going to be facilitating with some other key members of the Your Doctors Online team today this webinar. Just wanted to welcome you, ask for your patience for a few moments while we get settled, and we'll be starting the webinar in a couple of more minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning to those of you that are joining. My name is Sherry Wilson. I'm just wanting to welcome you. We're going to hold on for a few more minutes as people are continuing to jump into this webinar. We're just going to wait a few more minutes to allow some other participants to log in. <clears throat> If anyone's having trouble hearing me, please let me know. We're going to be using the chat feature, which is at the top right-hand corner of your screen, an orange button with an arrow on it. If you can't hear or you have anything that you want to ask up front before we get started, please use the chat feature, and we will do our best to answer any questions for you. Okay, so it's just about 11.30. We're just going to hold on a couple of more minutes to allow some others to join. Thank you for your patience. We do have the audience on listen mode right now, so if you do wish to speak up, <laughs> so to speak, please use and make use of the chat feature that's at the top right-hand side of your screen, an orange button that will allow you the opportunity to text in any questions you may have. Hopefully everyone will be hearing me okay. Okay, I can still see a few people are still joining in. 
So we'll just give it a couple more minutes before we get started. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, things are looking pretty good here. Um, I do want to just wait one more minute and see if anyone else is coming in. It seems that people are just trickling in one by one. We'll get started. Yep, still climbing up just <laughs> for a moment here. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to those of you that are being patient and waiting and settling into your seats, getting ready for the webinar. Thank you so much. My name is Sherry Wilson. I'm going to be helping to facilitate today's session, and we have some special guests as well as some founding members of the Your Doctors Online team that are going to be helping to facilitate and to enjoy this session with you today. <clears throat> For those of you just joining, just wanted to let you know we'll be starting just in one more minute and then we'll just let everyone have a chance to, to get started on the content for the webinar. Okay, this looks as good a time as any. Uh, for those that aren't quite signed in yet, we'll, uh, we'll take a quick break in a few moments and see if some others have joined and welcome them in. But first, allow me to formally introduce myself to you here in this webinar. My name is Sherry Wilson. I've been working with the founding members of the Your Doctors Online team for quite some time. It is our pleasure today to be having this first introductory webinar on the topic of anxiety and depression but also to do a few special things with you in introducing the chief advisory member of your doctors online, Dr. Richard Honecker. We're also going to be, of course, uh, inviting you to get acquainted with and through this content, the founding members of your doctors online and give an opportunity to learn about a new model that we have set up as a special invitation uh, for you to get really great sound health advice. Uh, and focus on certain topics. We're going to talk about the whole service of your doctors online in greater detail. First, I want to go back for a moment and talk about the great opportunity we have today to introduce and have the real pleasure in doing so, Dr. Richard Honecker. He is our chief medical advisor and a very proud supporter of your doctors online. We also want to have, of course, that opportunity to talk about the membership in details of your doctors online, focus in on really how you can benefit uh, from the great consultation, real live chats with doctors and get consultation of that human touch as opposed to going through an automated type environment to get this kind of health advice when you need it. So I wanna cover off a few logistics before I have the opportunity to introduce you to Dr. Honecker. Well, there's a chat feature in the room. We want to make this absolutely an interactive session. Um, please feel comfortable. If you have questions throughout the presentation, we want to invite you to ask them. So we're going to use the chat feature. For those of you who aren't familiar with this type of webinar, uh, on the top right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see an orange button with an arrow. And that allows you to either expand or to hide the um, chat feature. So you can remain anonymous on the topics. Any questions you may have for any of us at any time, please feel free to write them in and type them in the message box. And even if you have questions about um, anything related to the future endeavors on your doctors online, what have you, please feel, re feel welcome to do so. So I want to go into a little bit more on the introductions. Dr. Honecker, to give you a background, has been the president and CEO of the Family Medicine Associates of Texas. For more than 30 years, Dr. Honecker has been leading private practice, family medical clinic, 
and predominantly within Dallas, Texas and Charlottesville, Virginia. He's been managing clinics in his career with as many as 10 doctors in his practices under his direction. And he's also been voted as one of the best doctors in Dallas multiple times over many, many years. His education, to give you some insight and on his credentials, is both pre-med and med school foundationally in the uh, state of Virginia, the School of Medicine in Charlottesville, Virginia, to be specific. His intern internship was in Ohio, and then his residency was in Dallas, where he set up his own practice in a suburb in Dallas. Throughout the years of Dr. Conacher's, uh, sorry, Honaker's consulting, he's been with families and shown a keen interest in his practice um, in people that were coming in with symptoms of anxiety and depression. And in, in over the years of treating people, you know, we want this opportunity today and we're certainly going to take it and thank you very much to learn how you could shed some more light on the topic for us and give us some more knowledge and education as to how we can erode some of the stigma associated with depression. So without further ado, I would certainly and graciously like to invite and uh, welcome Dr. Richard Honecker. Well, thank you, Sherry. Thank you very much. And, and good morning to everyone. Um, and yes, today we'll be talking about depression and anxiety. These are two conditions and diseases, if you will, that are very common very important and very near and dear to my heart. Uh, in my career, I saw so many patients and still do with these symptoms and problems and there is so much that can be done and so many people suffer in silence and don't get proper treatment and it is so easily uh, available and so beneficial to every, everyone uh, who seeks that treatment. We'll, we'll talk about how to make all that happen in, in just a few moments. Uh, I did practice for uh, many years, uh, 30, 31 years in a uh, suburb of uh, Dallas, Texas, and now have moved uh, to Charlottesville, Virginia, where I went to medical school, and I see patients here some, and uh, still take a great interest in uh, depression and anxiety. So before we uh, get started, I want to offer you uh, and pose one question that we'll call a, a quick survey poll, and this question is, and you'll have an opportunity to uh, to uh, answer it, uh, as you can see on the screen, do you know anyone who could use help for potential depression or anxiety? I'll give you oh five to ten seconds to to make a choice there, and then we'll we'll start the talk. Okay. Well, let's talk first about depression, and then we'll get into anxiety. They, they do overlap, and they do interconnect, and they do affect each other. But depression, what is it? Well, it is a mood disorder. There's no secret to that. Uh, it has two primary symptoms, sadness and loss of interest. Sadness, uh, unhappiness, feeling hopeless, and then the loss of interest in normal activities that you used to enjoy. If you have those two symptoms, and depression is high on the list for, for your diagnosis, uh, this affects your thinking, your uh, feelings, and your behavior. And it affects all the people around you, your family, uh, your coworkers, uh, and your friends. Uh, and this is why it's such an important disease. It can have such an adverse effect on your relationships and your function in life, yet there's so much that can be done to make that better. And so how common is depression? Um, it's very common. Uh, one study showed that there were 14.8 million Americans who experienced depression in any given year, and that's about 6.7% of the population. Now, I think that number is low because a lot of people don't seek treatment, and therefore their numbers don't show up in these statistics. Uh, in my experience, uh, these numbers would be higher. So it's a very common disease. And Throughout one's lifetime, the likelihood that you'll have a depression is more than the likelihood that you won't in, in most cases, um, whether it be a depression based on some loss you've had, a loss of a loved one, a divorce, a job loss, or some unknown reason that uh, depression just came from the inside out. We'll talk about those causes in just a moment. Um, the women, women are 70% more likely to have a depression than men. There are reasons for that. Uh, some of it's hormonal, some of it's just neurotransmitters in the brain, and some of it's the stress 
and the cultural uh, requirements that uh, are put on women, uh, which, uh, as a man, I can say this pretty, pretty surely, you're, you're asked to do more than we are, and, and you do more than we do. That puts a lot of stress on you, and that can change the chemistry in your body. That can change the chemistry in your brain and affect the neurotransmitters, and depression and anxiety can ensue. Women are misdiagnosed 20 to 50 percent of the time. Isn't that horrible? I mean, they go to the doctor's office, they have fatigue, they have headaches, they have bowel problems, or uh, nervousness and sleeplessness. Well, these are symptoms of depression that we'll get to in just a moment, but often they're just diagnosed with uh, insomnia, treated with sleeping pills, or just weakness and fatigue, anemia, whatever, but a misdiagnosis is common, and it just should not happen, not nearly to the extent that it does. And again, it is an underreported. Both of these illnesses are underreported, uh, especially depression, because depression is on a continuum. There can be small, uh, medium, and large. Uh, and uh, these are uh, distinctions that we'll have to make as we talk uh, through, through this disease. <clears throat> so what are the causes? There are five. First of all, heredity, genetics. If you have a family member who has had depression, or bipolar disorder, or even post-traumatic stress disorder and this, these kinds of mental problems, uh, you are more likely than other people to have depression also. Now, these genetics can help the genetic uh, aspect of depression and to a lesser extent but still uh, a factor in anxiety, it can work for us in the following way. As we have mapped the human genome, we are able to now and will be able to more so in the future determine who is going to be more prone to depression. And if you, as a person genetically tested, uh, are going to be prone to have a depression, then you can take proactive steps to help uh, recognize it early, uh, or prevent it perhaps, and certainly get treatment early. Also, the genetics and the human genome mapping will help us learn how to treat you properly. Right now, the treatment is uh, the medication treatment. We often have to choose one of many different drugs and hope that it works and take an educated guess as a physician that it's the right medication for you. Now, sometimes that's not the right medicine. You have to switch around. Uh, and the genetic testing, I think, as the future goes on, and not too distant future, I'm talking in the next year or three years, we'll be able to sort of dial in and say, hey, this is the most likely class of medication that, it, that would help this particular person who's had his or her uh, gene mapping done. The second cause after genetics would be life circumstances, just what happens being a human being in life, and especially being a woman with the demands that are put upon you. The circumstances that cause stress uh, and worry, and, and these things can feed in and be part of, if not the entire cause of your depression. Thirdly, there are chemical changes. Now, these are on a genetic basis, we think, but also can be affected uh, by uh, things in the world that we don't understand yet, but chemical changes and the neurotransmitters in your brain. There's basically three of them, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And these can become imbalanced and improperly working uh, in the brain, and that can be a sole cause of depression and anxiety or one factor of many. Fourthly is hormonal changes, especially in women, of course. This can happen uh, both at the beginning of your reproductive years, at the end of your reproductive years, and, and basically any time. The fluctuations in hormones for women is of course, is far greater and far more regular and uh, troubling than in men. And this feeds into depression as well as anxiety. And then lastly, there are certain diseases that can look like depression and, and, and actually masquerade as depression. For example, low thyroid, uh, anemia, uh, and, and some other diseases. Now, these are uncommon causes and uncommon contributing factors to depression. But they need to be evaluated. They need to be watched for, and they need to be uh, investigated before you start treating, just to make sure that they are present. <clears throat> now, depression differs from simple sadness, um, and anxiety differs from simple stress. And here is how. Uh, sadness is something that comes and goes. It may be here one day and not another. It may be here for a couple of weeks and then nothing for a couple of weeks. When you have depression, generally that sadness is more persistent every day and lasts longer, maybe for six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks or longer. So it has to do with the frequency, uh, 
somewhat the severity and how long the duration of the symptoms that you have. That, that sort of separates simple, regular, day-to-day -day sadness from depression that is a chemical disorder that needs treatment. <clears throat> there are other disorders that, go, that uh, are related to and have depression as part of them. And these need to be investigated by your physician also, like bipolar disorder, um, post-traumatic uh, uh, post -traumatic stress disorder, uh, cyclothymia, which is where you move cycle back and forth, but not in such a great uh, fashion to label you as bipolar. Dysthymia, which is sort of low-grade sadness. I think you call dysthymia. Uh, starts with a D, D-Y-S-T-H-Y-M-I-A. Dysthymia has to do with sort of a low-grade sadness. It, it's probably more of a, a mild depression, uh, sharing many of the chemical characteristics of a major depression. And then premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which used to be called premenstrual syndrome, as well as the effects of certain drugs. Some medications can cause symptoms that look exactly like depression, and they can cause depression. So these are things you need to, to talk with uh, your doctor about. Now, there are two basic questions. There are two questions that you must ask yourself or ask anyone that can help you really screen for depression. And these questions are, in the past month, have you been troubled by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? And secondly, in the past month, have you experienced little interest or pleasure in doing things? Now, if the answer uh, to both of those questions is no, then there's a 90% chance that you do not have the depression as the cause of your symptoms. Still a 10% chance, statistically speaking. If the answer to either one of those questions is yes, then there's a 68% chance, if you go by certain studies, that you need that you may have depression and you need further testing to evaluate uh, the existence of depression or the non-existence of depression in you as a particular uh, unique patient. There are two scales that I've used in my career to diagnose depression, and these are things that you can use on to find online and are easy to take. There's the Beck Depression Inventory, B-E-C-K, the Beck Depression Inventory. This is, I think, a 20-question 20, 20 uh, questionnaire, and you can self-score that to decide and be told or be informed as to whether you have a depression, and if so, how severe. And then there's the Hamilton uh, scale. There are several of those, but the, the Hamilton scale is easily uh, found on the Internet, and it, too, can be self-scored, but it, it, that particular scale is usually better scored by uh, a clinician, somebody in the medical field. So let's talk now about the symptoms of depression. You know, what really, what, what really uh, draws one's attention to depression? Well, um, some are obvious and some aren't. Sadful, sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, and hopelessness. Now, we all experience that intermittently through our lives with certain things that may happen. But again, if this is something that happens more days than not, uh, for more than a few weeks, and and in, affects the function of your, your life and your relationships, then it's a, it's a symptom of depression. So sadness, cheerfulness, emptiness, and hopelessness. The loss of interest in things that used to interest you. This is called anhedonia, A-N-H-E-D-O-N-I-A. That's a big word for the loss of interest in the things that used to get you charged up, whether that be sports, hobbies, sex, vacation, whatever. Uh, these things just seem blah to you. And that's, that's a, a major sign of depression. Fatigue, there are lots of causes for fatigue, uh, some benign and some not so benign, but fatigue is a, is a symptom of depression. Slow thinking, poor concentration, slow, move, slow motion, there's something called psychomotor retardation. And that's where your brain is functioning in such a slow and depressed fashion that your emotions are slow and depressed. They're, you're walking, you're... you're just your work uh, habits uh, show a, a slowness to them in, in the use of your muscles and your joints and your arms and your legs. You may sleep too much or you may sleep too little, and that varies from person to person, but both extremes can be a symptom of depression. Same thing with appetite. Your appetite may go up, your appetite may go down, and your weight may go up, and your weight may go down. Any extreme like that from one end of the spectrum, to the, from one end of it to the other, uh, uh, may indicate depression and certainly is a symptom. 
unexplained physical symptoms, and this is one of the reasons that women are often misdiagnosed, and it's not good, uh, because many women, and men for that matter, will be seen by their doctors over and over again for things like low back pain, that re this persistent uh, chronic uh, joint pain, uh, headaches. Uh, these can be, if unexplained and uh, found to be not related to anything structural or anatomic, uh, these can be a sign or a symptom of depression. Withdrawal from activities and relationships. Uh, this has to do some with that anhedonia that we spoke about, but this is where you, you don't go places you used to go, you withdraw from things that you used to uh, take uh, an avid interest in, and uh, including relationships. Anger. This is more common in men as a symptom of depression in women, but it does occur in women. Uh, restlessness, where you just can't seem to unfidget yourself. Guilty feelings. If you have feelings of guilt and low self-esteem, this is a real important symptom of depression, and it's very common. It's the rare person with depression who does not have some guilt, feelings, unfounded usually, and self-esteem issues. It's hard to know which causes which, and there's probably sort of a, a bimodal effect where one, cause, one affects the other. <clears throat> so let's talk now a little bit about the treatment of depression. You know, my most, one of my most frustrating uh, parts of my career has been the patients that either won't seek treatment when I know it will help them, or they even admit that, and know that they have depression but refuse treatment because they're fearful of side effects or, or whatever else might, might cause, um, uh, you know, might come from uh, their treatment. Uh, and it's just frustrating because there's so much that can be done. Um, just prior, though, to getting into these treatment uh, treatment uh, aspects of this disease, I'd like to offer a second uh, quick survey poll with the following question. What is your biggest concern about getting treatment for depression? And you can see the cho choices, and uh, uh, please make your choice. I'll give you about five to ten seconds there, too. I think we're a fast-thinking group, perhaps. Okay, so let's get into treatment a little more uh, heavily here. Now, th there are things you can do without a doctor, and there are things you don't need a physician to help you with, or a healthcare professional of some sort, nurse practitioner, uh, anyone uh, in the medical field. But first of all, the things that you can do, exercise. Exercise is an incredibly uh, effective means to fight depression. It makes everyone feel better by virtue of the hormone, uh, the chemicals we've heard about called endorphins, but it, it also affects your body's cortisol level, your adrenaline levels, and key to any form of treatment for depression is exercise. And it has to be good aerobic exercise, a minimum of three times a week, uh, 30 minutes per time, uh, and to get your heart rate up to a certain level that is usually uh, uh, pinned at 80% of 220 minus your age. So 220 minus your age multiplied by 80%. This should be where your pulse rate should be kept for 30 minutes at least three times a week to have the minimum good effect on your body from the exercise, both cardiovascular as well as mental. Self-help groups. There are many of these. They're all over the Internet. And you can dial in depression or sadness or fatigue or, or insomnia, and, and you'll get plenty of opportunities uh, to, to elicit help. Um, there's something called the National Alliance on Mental Health, and I would urge you to... Uh, uh, seek that website, the National Alliance on Mental Health. Counseling is so important, uh, getting some sort of therapy. That's not essential, and you don't have to have it, but studies have shown over and over again that it is very important for most people to have some form of counseling to help make their depression better. And the same thing holds for anxiety. Now, a psychiatrist is going to be able to uh, prescribe medication for you, but a psychologist is going to be more involved in psychological therapy and counseling. Also, you can use a, a, a counselor. Uh, their initials are usually LCSW, Licensed Counselor and Social Worker, I believe that stands for. Uh, a church contact, it's your, your minister, your priest, your, your rabbi. Also, you can use your family doctor, perhaps, uh, uh, or one of the healthcare professionals that you see uh, as your primary care physician or healthcare provider. Uh, they often are well-trained in how to help you with therapy to help your depression improve. 
<clears throat> this type of therapy, I'd like to read you some of the things that this therapy can do and help you uh, cope with. First of all, it can help you adjust to crisis, a crisis. It can identify negative beliefs and behaviors and replace them with healthy positive beliefs. You can develop positive interactions with others, find better ways to cope and solve problems, identify issues that contribute to your depression and change behaviors that make it worse. You can regain a sense of satisfaction and control in your life and help ease your depression symptoms. And you can learn to set, re set realistic goals for your life and develop the ability to tolerate and accept distress using healthier behaviors. Mindfulness is a big thing. Uh, it's, a, it's been very important in uh, the medical literature over the past few years regarding how effective mindfulness therapy can be. It's sort of a form of meditation that has you living in the now. So I would urge you to look into mindfulness. Tai Chi and yoga and any form of meditation has been shown over and over again to improve the function of people with depression and to help medications work better. Music and art therapy is helpful. Spirituality uh, may, may help you if you're uh, bent in that direction, and this can be facilitated again by, uh, by your minister, your priest, your rabbi, uh, anyone associated with your, you know, your church. Now, there are many medications that can help your uh, depression, and uh, I'm a real proponent of these medications uh, for those patients uh, who do not respond to the methods we've already mentioned. Or for someone who has a severe enough depression that you really want to jump on this thing quickly. Or I, I have seen these medicines do such good for so many people. There are three or four major pressures. There's the SSRI. These are things like Prozac and Zoloft and Celexa. There's the SNRI. These are things like Cymbalta, Epexor, and Pristique. And the NDRIs, which is Wellbutrin. Now, these three different types of drugs affect the three different chemicals, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. There are other atypical medications, something called Remeron, Trintelix, Vibrid. There's a whole lot out there. Uh, they are good for people who can't uh, tolerate uh, side effects or have problems uh, with the other drugs that we just mentioned. Sometimes you'll need a combination treatment. You'll need um, maybe a small dose from one class or a, a dosage reduction in one drug from one class along with a smaller dose uh, from another drug in uh, another class. This will depend upon how you respond and uh, your physician's uh, approach to your, to your condition. There are ways to augment your treatment. For example, some people will respond better to an antidepressant when they have a very low dose of Ritalin, for example, uh, for ADD type uh, symptoms. Uh, or some thyroid hormones help that, but these are sort of not the most common treatment and we're not often needed, but if, if needed uh, in a very depression-resistant situation, they can help a lot. Now, if you do have problems with these medications, and this is a real fear that people have in side effects. I mean, the side effects can be uh, sexual dysfunction, fatigue, drowsiness, nausea. These are not common, but they can be troublesome, and they're very easy to approach or to, uh, to make better. For example, uh, if you do have certain side effects, you can reduce the dose. The doctor can reduce your dosage of the medication or change you completely to a completely different medication, or you can take two medications in small doses so that you minimize the side effects from either drug but maximize the benefits as they work together in synergy. For further resistant cases of depression, there is a new data uh, that is uh, more uh, supportive of electroconvulsive therapy. Um, this is what you saw in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which had Nicholson. It, it, it went out of favor for many years, but it's come back for people that, uh, that, that really needed it and don't respond to other treatments. And then there are transcutaneous, that's through the skin, magnets that go on the head and the neck and behind the ear. And there's, these are coming into some favor and uh, may help a lot. I think the next few years will tell us a lot more about that treatment. <clears throat> so how long do you want to have your depression treated? How long would it need to be, would it need to be treated? A lot of people don't want to get treated for depression with antidepressants because they're fearful that 
they will be hooked on the medication or have to stay on these medications for the rest of their lives. And that is just not true. You will not have to stay on these medicines for the rest of your life in all likelihood, uh, unless you're just one of these people with recurrent and persistent depression, in which case, I would tell you, those patients that I had like that welcomed being on the medication their whole life and wanted it because it made them feel so much better. But in general, if you have a response to a medication, to an antidepressant, you want to stay on that medication at the full dose that, you're, that, that got your good response for nine good months. After nine months of feeling very good emotionally and depression-wise, then it's safe to slowly pay for the drugs in most people. Now, in more severe depressions, and especially if there's suicidal thoughts and this kind of thing, we would probably go to 12 months, maybe 15 months. But in general, nine months for your average and medium level depression, uh, depressive disorder. Now, if you relapse at that nine month period, then it's probably a good idea to go back on the medicine for twice that time, 18 months. And some studies say, say if that happens again, you, you double that. Um, that's very, a uh, very personal decision that goes along with you based on your symptoms and your progress and based on your uh, medication uh, mixture as well as your physician's experience and comfort level with treating you uh, with the medications of long term or short term or medium term. Now there are two more aspects of depression that we'll talk about and then we'll hurry on to anxiety because we're running a lot of time here. First of all, if you do have suicidal thoughts, uh, and this is a very common uh, aspect of depression, there is a, a hotline called uh, 800-273-TALK. 800-273-TALK in the U.S. This is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And one final comment on depression is alcohol is not an antidepressant. A lot of people treat their depression or their depression symptoms with alcohol, and it does make them feel better temporarily because they sort of get away from their problems. But uh, alcohol has been shown that as a chemical, it is a depressant, not an antidepressant. So it's sort of like throwing gasoline on a fire a little bit at a time. I, I, I watch the alcohol with the depression. Okay, so let, let's move to uh, anxiety now. Uh, anxiety, again, is very similar to depression. Um, it is a normal emotion, and we often get it, of course. You know, life has its, uh, its problems. Uh, but uh, it's not always a normal emotion, especially when it gets uh, becomes persistent and uh, becomes uh, uh, gets in the way of your function uh, with the people around you. It does reduce your reduce the effectiveness and the happiness of your personal interactions and your social functions both at home and at work. Uh, and there are really four types of anxiety. Um, the fourth one is the most common, so I'll list the first three quickly. Panic disorder. This is where people may be in crowds or when they're going over, driving over bridges, they get sweaty, chest pain, palpitations, and choking. Very uncomfortable feeling, and they often have to leave, leave places that they're at. Um, and panic disorder can be effectively treated, but it's, it's a difficult problem. Social anxiety disorder. This is a, a self-conscious feeling where you are sort of fixated that others in the room are going to be judging you or ridiculing you. And, and you feel sort of automatically embarrassed. Um, I think we've all felt that a little bit, but if it's more than just a little bit, it, it, it could be a true problem that you have. Uh, the third anxiety disorder is our phobias. And we've all heard about these, you know, the phobia, uh, 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 being afraid of heights, uh, high speeds, spiders and snakes. I think that's relatively normal, but there are phobias that do occur along those lines that are, that are sort of uh, severe. And then the most common is what's called generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder. This is the most common, and this is an excessive, unrealistic worrying and tension feeling with little or no reason. It's a very common disorder. A lot of people just suffer through it, just like they do with depression, and there are effective ways to treat this. First of all, the treatment uh, entails the exercise again for the endorphins that come out, reduce caffeine, and uh, uh, Soda pop that has caffeine in it, like uh, it's not just coffee, it's soda pop and, and uh, energy drinks. Get good sleep. Stage four sleep is when you do conflict resolution. We all have conflicts through our life and, through our, and during our days. And when you go to sleep and you get into stage four sleep, you have conflict resolution. Now, if you don't spend enough time in stage four because you have restless sleep or you don't spend enough 
uh, you don't do through enough cycles of stage four in because you say oh, we get six hours of sleep instead of eight, then you're going to have poor conflict resolution, and that uh, that moves you into depression and anxiety type symptoms. There are self-help groups. Uh, the National Alliance on Mental Health uh, has a good website, and you can get involved uh, with uh, anxiety treatment uh, there. Counseling again, psychologists can help you with counseling. Uh, licensed uh, counselors and social workers, church contacts, your primary care physician can help you also. Mindfulness, Tai Chi, and yoga, just as we spoke about with depression, is very helpful in anxiety, and it's shown over and over in studies that it is helpful. It doesn't seem to be quite as helpful for anxiety as depression, but definitely makes a difference. Uh, medications. Medications can be a problem in anxiety because some of them are habit forms. For example, alprazolam and clonazepam, they are wonderful. Treated short-term, treated on a short-term basis for anxiety. But over the long term, they can be a little bit habit for me, but if you use low doses and even regularly use low doses, sometimes that can help a person with persistent and severe anxiety who, who doesn't respond to other medications. Now, some of the antidepressants also will help with depression. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, with anxiety. Some of the antidepressants like Prozac and Zoloft, et cetera, it can have the same uh, chemical uh, beneficial effects on the brain when people have just simple and uh, or just simple anxiety instead of depression. Side effects of these medications uh, are the same as we spoke about with depression. The uh, alprazolam and clonazepam can make you a little sleepy, but that's not too bad. But you've got to be careful with them if you're going to be dry. <clears throat> and cognitive behavioral therapy is another. Uh, go-to therapy that people can get from their psychologist for um, their anxiety. Uh, and finally, again, just a reminder, reduce caffeine. Caffeine does help you get up and get going and get moving, but it does feed into anxiety. <clears throat> and, and finally, will treatment help you? And that is a resounding yes for both of these diagnoses. It does wonderful things if you'll just stick with it and try your best to get on something that helps you. And I hope I hope this talk has helped you. I hope it's bro broken down some barriers on ways that you can uh, uh, help diagnose yourself or be diagnosed, uh, broken down barriers to seeking treatment and taking treatment and putting up with some of the side effects that may be less severe than the bad things that happen from depression and anxiety. Now, if you have any questions, we'll have a, a question segment in just a little bit. and. Uh, I hope, uh, again, that this has been helpful, and if you are feeling any of these symptoms that we spoke about, please please get treatment. It's, it's, a, it's a really good thing to do. Thank you very much, and I'll, I'll turn things back over to Sherry now. Thank you so much, Dr. Honecker. You know, wow is one thing I just want to say. The amount of information that you've shared with us today is huge. There's so many of the topics that you presented and so many common everyday things that you're highlighting today that you know many of us are just living with and around as people so so helpful and valuable to have you here with us thank you so much I did you're want welcome. to take, thank you so much again um, for a moment here I'm sure if it's not just myself there may be others who are participating today on this webinar who may want to give feedback and also perhaps ask some additional questions to Dr. Honecker while we've, we have all the things that he's mentioned present in our minds. I want to reintroduce that chat feature that we have in the webinar. If you click at the top right hand side of the screen, you'll be able to expand the chat window and be able to ask any questions and we'll be able to get those answers for you. So you can see we've had a few surveys as well along the way in introducing uh, this topic of anxiety and depression. And this is just one of many to come. Today's actually breaking ground for us in your doctors online as a service in offering this type of snapshot view, if you will, of the type of quality consultation that you can expect to receive as a result of signing on as a member of your doctors online. You know, one of the key objectives behind this service and the founding members, Naman Jaffer and the other esteemed gentlemen who are part of this, including Dr. Honecker, you know, really wanted to improve the lives of people around the world and certainly make more accessible from anywhere at any time 
you know, questions getting answered, concerned, concerns about health getting answered. So let me talk a little bit more about our membership and about the service of your doctors online. You know, what problem does it solve? How it works a little bit further. One thing I just wanted to note that I thought was quite interesting, did you know that misdiagnosis and medical errors are the third leading cause of death in North America? And that's based on various studies from within both Harvard Medical School and John Hopkins. Further to that, sources, sources do say that 12 million people, that's about 5% in the USA, are misdiagnosed annually. In 2014, BMJ quality and safety is always a concern and still is. So anywhere from 250 to 400,000 US deaths annually are being stat, uh, put into the stats due to medical errors and misdiagnosis. One thing we just want to do is really, first and foremost, improve those stats. Make sure that people have better access to medical care. And I don't know, <laughs> just listening to your consultation with us today, Dr. Honecker, I mean, just the value of not having to drive to a doctor's appointment, to a clinic, having the comfort of our own homes and doing this and speaking with you in a more relaxed, easier manner is huge. So if this gives, it certainly gave that for me. And uh, again, you know, as a snapshot today, for those of you that are joining as well, I hope that you're, uh, you're having an idea as to the why behind this service and why it was created. We're gonna aspire as a team and as a service to become the world's first virtual clinic for women health issues and provide quality, affordable, and easily, more easily accessible medical opinion that matters. We have board certified North American specialists, not general physicians only. So our mission at Your Doctors Online is again to provide that highest level of credibility, quality consultation from world renowned doctors and make it accessible those opinions that matter most, whether it's a first opinion, a second, a third, a fourth, whatever we need as individuals to feel comfortable that we are getting help when we need it for ourselves and, and our loved ones. So moms, myself included, women out there, convenience is certainly a key focus and that's been also one of the driving factors behind this service is the convenience of it all. You know, speaking for myself alone, I work full time, I have two beautiful children, I've got all the management and maintenance of life. <laughs> and it can get busy and stressful, as Dr. Honecker was saying. <laughs> so, um, you know, those conditions, I'm sure several times in my life already, I could hit the nail in terms of some symptoms and could be, have been diagnosed with depression, anxiety. So thankfully, it hasn't taken over my life in major parts, uh, but Thank goodness, uh, you know, the stigma is eroding in, uh, and it's only gonna get better and better, I expect, with the likes of yourself, doctor, helping us and consulting with us and, and making it more common every day. So the membership that I wanted to speak about is a special exclusive offer. It's $9.99 US a month with no commitment. So the big thing as well is, other services, telehealth in Canada as an example, could just be a general number that you call and you're getting general advice. And certainly that's great. This is something very different. This is getting real credible, specialized uh, advice on topics and it's unlimited, 24 hours a day. You're getting secure consultation and chatting with a registered doctor. And whether it's a psychologist or a specialist, a dietitian, all of those related in this case, as we're talking about anxiety and depression, you know, someone who can help you uh, from a diet perspective relating to getting more exercise into our lives and treating depression. You get preferred access to North American specialists again, and I can't say enough, you know, you're, you're not going to get into a commitment that isn't affordable for you that isn't something that you can have control over. Um, it's a monthly mem membership, and as you need it, it's available. 
You have access, of course, as well to some great risk assessment tools. So for real chronic issues, um, very serious health issues such as cancers and such, um, you can also get an understanding through some assessment tools of uh, where you're at in terms of probability or potential to, uh, to have one of those conditions happening into your health. So those are some of the benefits as well. And there's much more to come. We're continuously developing in the background, learning from patients that have already taken advantage in these earliest stages of your doctors online, being available. And we're gonna continue to learn from you, with you, and of course, from our esteemed doctors that are on our panel of con consultants that will help you and advise you on your health. So it's, we also have, you know, more, <laughs> more convenience than you could ever possibly imagine in terms of what other services are out there and the quality of the advice that you can expect. So it's entirely up to you. It's available for you to use as much or as little as you want for yourself, for others. Perhaps you have parents who you're wanting to uh, get some help for or your children. Um, it's, it's all there for you and your family as often as you need it and as you wish to continue. Part of subscribing to your doctors online is that free access, of course, as I mentioned to the tools. And again, I can't iterate enough. It's $9.99 US per month. Now, if we can just move forward. And if there's any further questions you wanna ask, this would be a fantastic time to do so. You can remain anonymous. Again, if you click on the top right-hand corner of the screen in this webinar, you will have just like a texting feature, the ability to ask questions and we'd we'll be happy to answer any of them. Is there anything further you wanted to add at the moment, doctor? Um, no, just, well, yes, uh, just to reiterate, uh, my, the main two points, I think, would be that, uh, uh, and perhaps three points, um, it's a very, these are very common diseases, number one. Number two, they're very treatable diseases. And number mm -hmm. three, the side effects of treatment are very manageable. Mm -hmm. And the barriers to getting diagnosed and treat, treated need to be uh, broken down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. And if there are any other questions, again, I just want to suggest and uh, recommend that you write them down into the message box in the chat feature here in the room. We also are excited to think about the future webinars we're gonna be holding on behalf of your doctors online. Our next webinar is gonna be scheduled on July 20th, 2017. And we're open to receiving feedback on su and suggestions from you in this audience, and perhaps even in follow-up to today's webinar. Right now, we're thinking about women's health, of, of course, again, as the key focus, but it doesn't have to be limited to that at, at all. And, um, you know, on the, on the topic of, you know, how to look younger as we grow older, and uh, we will welcome the opportunity to have a focused chat on that and uh, allow people to ask questions as we are in this webinar as well. Is there anything further that uh, you'd like to share with us? Is that you, yes, sir? Yeah, hi. Um, Hello. Hi, so uh, hi, everybody. My name is Yasser, and I'm a marketing specialist at Your Doctors Online. So first, I'd just like to thank you, Sherry and Dr. Honecker. It was a wonderful presentation. I hope everyone found it as informative as I did. So um, now I'm going to help facilitate the Q&A session. And um, uh, if any, again, if anybody has any further questions that they'd like to ask, again, I'll direct you to the questions tab at the right side of your screen. And you can continue to ask questions from there. Great. So um, I'm just going through our questions now. I, I'll direct I, either, either question to either Dr. Honecker or uh, one of the members at Your Doctors Online who would be able to answer the, the question. So our first question I will give to Dr. Honecker. 
an attendee wants to know, uh, can hormonal changes affect women in their early 20s? Well, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, at the, the, the peak time that hormonal fluctuations in a woman can cause depression and or anxiety is going to be at the beginning of their reproductive years, uh, in the teens, in the early reproductive years, in the 20s, and uh, at, at the change of life in the menopausal time. So, yes, certainly um, uh, in the 20s um, is when hormonal things are still fluctuating a little more widely, widely than they would in the 40s, but not quite as bad as in the, in the teen years. Um, but this is a time also when stress on a woman is greater in the 20s. There are life changes that are occurring after uh, the educational years, along with the hormonal changes. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot, uh, a lot of, uh, I wouldn't, I guess I would call it damaging or uh, adverse effects from the hormonal fluctuations in the uh, in the teens, twenties, and and even in the thirties too. Okay, thank you. Our next question again for Dr. Honecker: um, How do you identify anxiety from normal stress? <clears throat> that is a good question. Um, you know, anxiety um, when it is a disorder. Uh, is more severe than stress. It, it, it tends to affect lifestyle functioning. When you're stressed out, you can usually override that if it's just simple stress. You override that to uh, be congenial and enjoyable at a party or to um, have dinner with friends or meet uh, someone at work or go for an uh, interview. If it's more than simple stress, then that anxiety gets into your ability to function in those situations where you have to step up to the plate a bit more, and you can't function as well, whether it be an interview for a job or uh, just interacting as a parent or a friend. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's when it gets into your functioning. Um, and uh, secondly, if it happens more days than not. Regular stress may happen daily, but often it comes and goes, and there'll be good times and bad times. An anxiety disorder that needs treatment tends to happen relatively regularly. Now, that being said, even intermittent stress, which is simple stress and not an anxiety, like a generalized anxiety disorder, even simple stress that is disturbing and distressing to you, even if it doesn't fit the bill of what I just pointed out, it is still anxiety that does cause dysfunction because it troubles you more than just a little. And if that's the case, you can get that treated too, whether it be through exercise or medications. Okay, thank you. Um, again, for Dr. Honecker, uh, can depression be triggered by pregnancy? Oh, absolutely. Um, the uh, you know, postpartum depression is, of course, a, a, a very well-known um, entity that has some horrible drastic effects as we have heard of, uh, over the years, but certainly the hormonal fluctuations that occur with pregnancy, whether it be early, middle, or, or late, or postpartum, have, have a, a big effect on depression and anxiety. And, and these are things that OB-GYN doctors and primary care doctors need to be sort of screening for uh, with pregnant patients. I think if, if I were an uh, uh, obstetrician and gynecologist, any one, any of my pregnant patients, I would ask them to take, take the Beck Depression Inventory or the Hamilton Scale monthly and sort of keep a score and see if the score is going up or going down. Because oftentimes during pregnancy, your, your brain and your body are so messed up, for, for lack of a better word, that you don't see the changes occurring and they may be just gradual. But if you take that that depression inventory and score a two in, in, in four weeks of pregnancy and then score a 10 in, uh, you know, three months or four months of pregnancy, then that will draw your attention to the fact that it's time for some intervention, something to be done so that you can avoid a full-blown, horrible, horrible depression, especially once the, the baby is born and uh, stress really goes up. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm... Um... The next two questions are set sort of similar. I'll ask them to you together. So, um, 
if I start medication for depression, will I have to continue for an indefinite period? Will the depression come back after I stop? Is it possible to smoothly transition off the medication? Yes, it is possible and probable to to uh, smoothly and, and uh, gradually go off the medication. And you are not hooked in on these drugs forever. You, do, you don't get hooked on them. They, your body does not become dependent upon them. And you do not have to take them for your whole life. Most people with a single first episode of depression will need treatment for just nine to 12 good months. And that means after they have a good and full response, stay on the medicine nine months at least and maybe up to 12 months. And then you get off the medication. You gradually go off it over a 30-day uh, or six-week period. Um, now, some people uh, will relapse when that happens. Their depression will come back a few months later or maybe a year or two later. And in that case, you would probably, you, we as physicians would treat for twice that time more like 18 months instead of 9 months, or 24 months instead of 12 months. It's the low percentage of patients who need treatment over and over and over and forever. But as I mentioned at one point in my, in my talk, um, those patients, in my experience, those patients who had recurrent and multiple uh, episodes of depression were more than happy to stay on the medicines forever uh, because they felt so much better on them. They don't have to stay. They didn't have to stay on them, and many times they would just go off to see how they would do. But most would want to go back to them. But again, most people with depression are not going to need lifelong treatment, and not going to need long-term treatment. And it is easy to gradually get someone off medications with no side effects from uh, going off the medications. Okay. Um, our next question, I'm going to direct to Noman, who is one of our founding members at Your Doctors Online. Um, the question is, what is the membership that Your Doctors Online is showcasing? Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Yasser, Dr. Honecker, and, and Sherry, first of all. Um, so to answer the question, as uh, Sherry indicated, uh, the membership uh, is really focused on the women target market. Um, and what it is showcasing, as uh, you would have seen in the slide before, is uh, the ability for uh, people who today have medical questions, uh, so they have literally two options. Either they will go and see a doctor, um, which sometimes is inconvenient because if you're working or uh, are busy, it, it, you have to take half the day off and go and see a doctor. Or the other option for them it has been to go and Google or uh, search on WebMD. Um, so what we are doing with our membership uh, for this $9.99, uh, no commitment membership, is the capability uh, for these people to be able to go and talk to a doctor or chat with a doctor online, a real doctor, human doctor, um, a psychologist, dietitian. We are also adding more um, specialists in that category. Um, so we allow them to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and clear um, the air with respect to their medical questions. Um, the doctors or the psychologists and dietitian today will give them uh, medical advice on what is the best route uh, for them, which specialist, or um, what they need to do in terms of seeking further information. So I hope that answers the questions, uh, Yasser. Yeah, thank you. Um... So our next question, I guess either of you could answer. Um, the question is, is Dr. Honecker available for consultation on depression through your doctors online? Yes, I am. The answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, the next question is for Dr. Honecker again. Um, the question is, when is a good time to seek out therapy? When is a good time to seek out therapy? Yes. Um, well, at, at any time, there's no good or bad time. When it becomes a troublesome problem, when it becomes more than just mild or starts getting into the your function in life in normal daily activities, uh, as I mentioned, like job interviews, parenting, uh, meeting with friends, um, the sooner the better, however, in that um, once a depression gets 
solidified, gets sort of stuck in your system, it's a little harder to, to pull you back from it. And people with depression tend to get apathetic. They tend to withdraw and don't seek treatment. So I think when you're, when, before you lose your motivation to get well, uh, because you feel so blah and uh, don't seek care for your depression. I think getting getting help before that time is important. So I would say when you notice that there's been a significant change in the way you feel on a day-to-day -day basis for more than four to six weeks, I would call that time to get uh, to get some help. At least take the one of those depression scales or Hamilton scales. Okay, thank you. Um, again, our next question is for Dr. Honecker. Can anxiety and stress lead to mood swings and extreme anger? Would you repeat that again? I'm sorry, my computer made a noise. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, can anxiety and stress lead to mood swings and extreme anger? Yes, absolutely. Especially in men, but also in women. Um, uh, and the chemical changes that happen with depression, stress, and mood swings are the same chemical reactions that occur in, in people with anger disorders and, and uh, outbursts of anger that occur, you know, road rage and that kind of thing. Um, the, the anger in women, who we're mainly talking about today, generally happens uh, at home. Um, they tend to override it at the workplace and with friends, but the family pays the price on that. And uh, it, it's not the woman's fault that uh, these outbursts come, it's the chemicals and the, the nature of depression that, that sometimes is manifested in anger and it just sort of comes out in outbursts and irritability and again it affects your parenting skills and um, that's not a good thing of course. Thank you. Um, again for Dr. Honecker, uh, can you comment on what proactive steps someone with seasonal, seasonal depression can take? Is pre-medication routinely done in the fall? That's uh, well. That is a wonderful question, and something I face so many times in my in my practice with patients. If you're a person who has seasonal affective disorder, uh, this is for those of you that don't know. This is for people who have depression that gets predominantly uh, predominantly occurs when uh, the cold weather comes and the sunshine uh, occurs less. And there's a chemical reason for that. It's a biochemical reason and kind of beyond the scope of our, our talk today, but, but it certainly is a true thing that happens. And you may have depression that just gets worse during the winter months or depression that occurs only in the winter months. And yes, premedication is in order for that kind of situation. My patients who had recurrent seasonal affective disorder, uh, they could predict when they were going to start getting bad, November 15th or whatever. And what we would do at that point is on um, September, or October 15th, we would start medication, the medication that we know worked last winter. Or we would start light therapy. Light therapy is a wonderful thing for seasonal affective disorder. Um, people just spend 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour a day, in front of a, a special light that, that mimics sunshine and sort of helps fool the body into thinking it's not dark and unsunny, <laughs> and therefore their disposition improves. So yes. Definitely pre-treatment. Okay, thank you. And now another question for Noman. Once I have a membership, can I only use it for myself or can I report issues for my children as well? Great question um, and thank you for that question. Yes, the answer is uh, absolutely. The idea of a membership focused uh, for the women target is um, that they are literally making 90% of the home health decisions. So yes, they can ask questions about themselves, about their kids, about their family, husband, and even with friends as well. Thank you. And back to Dr. Honecker, um, our next question asks if uh, a person biting nails is an early sign of anxiety. It can be, not necessarily. But it can be, uh, and, and more often than not, I would say it is, but not always. Uh, biting nails, picking at fingers, any sort of little repetitive habit is generally a, a way that the person is subconsciously or consciously, but usually subconsciously, trying to work out the anxiety. They may pace, they may have 
sort of throat clearing, like a tick, you know, where they clear their throat a lot or wink a lot. But yeah, finger picking and fingernail biting uh, in kids and young people um, is a sign that is a symptom of anxiety. Um, and it doesn't always develop into something bad, but again, it, it, it is very treatable, so, along with all the anxiety disorders. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is again for Dr. Honecker. What is the maximum time for taking a depression medicine? What if the depression doesn't come as long as you are taking medicine and then comes again if it stops? Well, the, the maximum time is every day for the rest of your life you can take these medications. They don't have any downside. They don't cause cancer and they, they don't cause things that are bad uh, taken long term. Uh, and uh, again, it's a, it's a, a small percentage of people do need these things uh, forever and ever. And typically for those people who tend to need medications long term, we try periodically to get them off the medications just to just to do so and save money, or uh, although they're relatively inexpensive drugs, but um, periodically you try to, to get off of the medications, and, and that sometimes helps. But uh, again, there's no downside to it, and yeah, a lot of people or some people do need chronic treatment, and because they are uh, relapsing, mm -hmm. and I would say probably maybe 20% of people with depression, maybe 30%. Um, do have at, at least one recurrence, and I would say 10 or 15, 20 percent require uh, treatment for many, many uh, bouts of depression, if not uh, on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. I think that was our last question. Yep. So um, I'll turn it back over to Sherry to end the webinar. Sherry, I believe you might be on mute. Oh, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> hello again, uh, everyone. You. Let me just repeat what <laughs> I said. Thank you very much, Yasser. <laughs> that you. was great. Um, and thank you as well, Dr. Honecker, and thank you to Naman Jabber for answering those initial questions that have come up through this webinar. I did mention that we have an idea about uh, the topic we'd like to present in this next webinar that we are planning for around the July 20th timeframe at this point and on the topic of how to look younger as we grow older. But I also wanted to open it up now. Here's a great time, as any, to, uh, to let us know some topics that you think would be great to, uh, to bring into focus in our future webinars. So if you'd like to do that, we are more than welcoming you today to do so and to uh, type those in through the chat feature. More than welcome to do so separately, contacting either um, Naman or uh, following up through the uh, Your Doctors Online. We would love that. Um, so Dr. Honecker, is there any final words you wanted to share with the audience today before, before we, uh, we close off the webinar? Yes, um, please don't be afraid to get treatment for your depression and your anxiety, and please let us know what you would like to talk about in the future. Uh, I know a lot of the things that people worry about and want to hear about, um, mm -hmm. but you're the best people to tell us uh, what to talk about next and, and help you uh, on whatever aspect of uh, your life and your health uh, is important to you. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you to every one of you who have joined us today. We very much appreciate your support and your interest. As I mentioned, this is the very first of its kind for our team at Your Doctors Online to be creating these types of webinars to give back to you uh, some inform information and medical advice that could also help others including yourself and your family down the road. So thank you so much. Thank you for my colleagues uh, who have been working on this webinar as well. And we look forward to you joining us on our next one. Thank you.